This video is sponsored by Frome.co. Dinosaurs. <laughs> the ultimate in charismatic megafauna. Sure, dragons are cool, but dragons aren't real. Jesus Christ, that thing's real! And while an interest in dinosaurs is pretty common for your average American boy growing up in the 1990s, I've never shaken the fascination. Dinosaurs were my entry point into science. I started learning about dinosaurs in pre-K, which soon led to biology, ecology, geology, deep time, hell, even just imagining the past. I have these sense memories as a kid of just wandering around the forest, thinking about how whole ecosystems rose and fell long before there was a single human being around to witness them. It was also enigmatic, terrifying, and inspiring, and all of it within the realm of human understanding. To know paleontology is to know geopolitics. When I was an undergrad in college, I got to go on a real live dinosaur dig, and the professor had with him this massive color-coded geologic map of the entire state of Wyoming, where each color represented the age of the exposed bedrock. This thing was accurate down to the square acre, and I asked him, where'd all the money for this come from? Did some paleontology department pinch pennies until it could finally afford to map an entire state? And he said no, they weren't the university's maps at all. They were borrowed from the oil industry. Dinosaurs were also my entry point into a whole swath of historical and political subjects. I learned about the bloodless democratic revolution of Mongolia by reading about Tarbosaurus. I got really into cryptozoology in middle school, and it was while researching evidence for the existence of Mokili Mbembe that I first heard about the CIA's involvement in the assassination of the democratically elected prime minister of the Republic of the Congo. Yeah pretty heavy stuff. My point is that an interest in dinosaurs is only ever as juvenile as we want it to be, and I don't want it to be that way at all. I want to approach the study of dinosaurs with the same interdisciplinary interest and purpose that I bring to the study of history, geography, politics, Art. Dinosaur art, in particular, is one area where I feel I've got the most to contribute to. The intersection of art and entertainment is my lane, and the body of scholarly work surrounding dinosaur cinema is pretty lacking. Most of what you find on YouTube are just a bunch of nostalgic appraisals from my fellow white boys, which is fine, but I want to expand the discourse, age it up a bit, see if we can make it interesting for the people who aren't already interested in dinosaurs. And if you're still wondering why I care so much, no prizes for guessing, dinosaurs were my entry point into cinema too. The very first film that I remember seeing in theaters was Jurassic Park, and as if it couldn't get any more faded, The Land Before Time came out the exact same day that I was born. That isn't true. I was actually born one week earlier. The same day that Ernest Saves Christmas came out. But how cool would that have been if I had? Now, when I first sat down to make a video about dinosaur cinema, I thought I'd do like a simple little introductory survey course. But then I immediately came up with a list of 34 films I wanted to talk about in one video. Which, in hindsight, <laughs> Yeah, I always tell myself I'm just gonna make like one point about each film and then get through a whole list of them in like 20 minutes. But then I start writing and the script hits 2,000 words before I'm even done talking about colonialist tropes and adaptations of the lost world. Good. You caught us! So I guess what I'm saying is that this is gonna be like a new semi-regular series on the channel, Saurian Cinema. Episode two, I'll tell you right now, is gonna be about colonialist tropes within adaptations of the Lost World. In fact, it was originally gonna be episode one, but after two weeks of scripting, I realized there was still a lot more reading I needed to do. Just as well, because now I get to start with a movie that everybody would've just been waiting around for me to do if I wasn't gonna start with it anyway. I'm talking about the undisputed, gold standard, Mac Mommy of all dinosaur films, Jurassic Park. <laughs> Dinosaurs are breeding. Part 1. Formal Film Criticism versus Nostalgic Fanboys my favorite thing about formal film criticism is that you can apply it to anything. Explore any idea with literally any film. You don't have to wait around for a movie to provide you with a specific reading. You can do that on your own and thereby expand the discourse in a near infinite number of ways. You could do a feminist reading of The Land Unknown, a postmodern reading of A Sound of Thunder, a Marxist reading of Planet of Dinosaurs, you're not asking if a film is feminist, postmodern, or Marxist. Keep that in mind, that's gonna be important later. You're just using these theoretical frameworks as a way to explore the wider implications of a specific school of thought within the context of a kick-ass subject. Oh, yes, like the public is that easily manipulated. Ow, ow, hey, 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 suck, 
Avatar! You could analyze Jurassic Park through any number of critical frameworks, but I think gender makes the most sense, since it comes up in Jurassic Park a lot more frequently and a lot more explicitly than in most sci-fi action thrillers. There are several major plot points that hinge on gender. And how do you know they can't breathe? Well, because all the animals in Jurassic Park are female. The text itself has more than zero things to say about it. We can discuss sexism and survival situations when I get back. Then there's all the various ways in which gender is coded throughout the film. Everything from Grant and Sattler's color-coded shirts to the fact that Tim's agency and sense of adventure tend to get rewarded by the narrative, whereas Lex tends to get clobbered. Where's the goat? <gasps> oh, did you think this was just gonna be another glowing YouTube review of a beloved 90s action film? I only ask because I wanna know how many nostalgic fanboys are already writing defensive screeds in the comments before I've even said what I actually think. In 2005, author and film critic Joshua David Bellin published Framing Monsters, Fantasy Film and Social Alienation, in which he gives a gendered analysis of Jurassic Park. Basically, a close reading of the film that focuses on how it frames, codes, and editorializes gender. And he comes out swinging. Jurassic Park represents the patriarchal family as threatened and besieged by monstrous women, while at the same time seeking to resolve the threat and absolve the father by collapsing ideology into biology. Basically, Bellin argues that Jurassic Park is a coded call to suppress female reproductive autonomy, and for men to take their rightful, natural places as heads of the patriarchal nuclear family. He argues that both the narrative and the camera work prioritize male vision, male thought, and male agency. Women are belittled, mocked, and even punished for attempting same. <laughs> Sure, men might cause all the problems in Jurassic Park, but they're also the ones who fix them, and what's more, they're the ones the problems are supposed to be fixed for. If on the one hand, the film presents men as prideful violators of the natural order, on the other, it celebrates the right of patriarchy to rule a female world depicted as chaotic and unpredictable. Well, that's... bad. But does it actually track? Part 2. Men are from Mars, women are from the Cretaceous. In essence, Jurassic Park is a story about an island full of female dinosaurs that are recreated by a team of almost exclusively male scientists who are subsequently put in danger when the dinosaurs do the two things they're not supposed to do, breed and break free. As Bellin puts it, the abdication of the paternal role, men's trifling and reproduction outside the nuclear unit, has loosed a band of screeching harpies who rend and tear those foolish enough to court them. Enter Alan Grant, a man who wants nothing to do with kids at the start of the film, which is then presented as his one great flaw. Oh, yeah, they look, they're noisy, they're messy, they're expensive. Cheap, cheap. They smell. In fact, a disinterest in children reads as almost every male character's major flaw. Gennaro might be a greedy, profit-minded lawyer. We're gonna make a fortune with this place. But it's not until he abandons the kids to the T-Rex that he's finally punished in the narrative. No. Malcolm fares at least slightly better. He comes off as a total cad in the first half of the film, who leaves a trail of unsupported children in his wake. Get any kids. Me? Oh, oh, hell yeah, three. I love kids. Mm. Anything at all can and does happen. Who at least partially redeems himself by trying to distract the Rex long enough for Grant to rescue the kids. As Bellin notes, Malcolm doesn't die, he merely suffers a broken leg. Enough to lay him up for a while and perhaps afford him time to atone for past indiscretions. Then there's Nedry. Poor, subcontracted Nedry. Like, ask me sometime how a union could have saved Jurassic Park. A man who's consistently codified as a smutty teenager. Look at this workstation! What a complete slut. Barely capable of fathering children, much less raising them. I actually kind of love Bellin's reading of Nedry, though. In an enactment of the teenage boy's wet dream and worst fear, Nedry meets his end at the hands and mouth of a coy, frilly creature that turns into a terror in the front seat of a car parked on a ledge evocative of a 1950s-era lover's lane. Grant, by contrast, is presented as a man who isn't a bad dad so much as a man who needs only to channel his energy into family commitment to bring order to chaos. Even at the very start of the film, Grant is consistently characterized as a level-headed, problem-solving go-getter who just needs to direct those energies into rearing children in order to be redeemed. As Bellin puts it, Grant represents the power of the father to negotiate and tame a wild, feminized nature. What species is this? You know that scene in the movie where Grant ties two female seatbelt ends together in the helicopter in order to keep himself secure? Most everyone I know interprets that scene as like a coy foreshadowing as to the fact that an island full of all female dinosaurs have figured out how to make it work as it were. But Bellin's got a different interpretation. He says that the image of Grant subduing two recalcitrant sisters by literally tying the knot is another way that the film's imagery reinforces this heteropatriarchal ideal. 
Now, it wouldn't be the wildest thing to suggest that a Steven Spielberg film has a certain fascination with fatherhood. And I'll be the first to admit, it's even more pronounced in the sequels. One of the most remarkable constants in the three Jurassic Park films released by the year 2001 is that, though they're all about dinosaur attacks and hairbreadth escapes in one respect, they're all about the creation or restoration of father-centered families in another. And I think Bellin is spot on here. You've got Ian Malcolm trying to rescue his girlfriend and repair the relationship with his estranged daughter in The Lost World, and Paul Kirby trying to save his son and, I don't know, Loki get back with his ex in Jurassic Park 3? I miss fishing. This is, without doubt, my least favorite thing about any of the Jurassic Park sequels, their stubborn refusal to explore new themes. Although, to be fair, one of my favorite things about Jurassic Park 3 is that Paul Kirby isn't the main character. It's no Alan what. Fuck You Pay Me Grant. Here we are in the worst place in the world, we're not even being paid. But even just restricting the discussion to Jurassic Park, Bellin concludes, The film's moral calculus is thus disarmingly simple. The measure of a man is his fidelity to fatherhood, and the punishments meted out to the male characters bear a direct relationship to that factor. I mean, except when they don't. Bellin doesn't talk much about Muldoon, Mr. Arnold, or John Hammond, and for good reason. There's nothing much paternal about any of their fates. They do little to strengthen his argument. Hammond endangers Lex and Tim by bringing them to the island in the first place, but I guess he recognizes his hubris in the end, and that means he's not marked for death? Meanwhile, Muldoon and Mr. Arnold are both mercilessly slaughtered by the raptors, even though they both seem like competent, proactive, and even fairly selfless guys. Three minutes, I can have power back on the entire park. We're gonna have to cut the tour short, I'm afraid. But enough about the men. Part three, the one and only adult female human. Bellin spends much of his time comparing Dr. Grant to Dr. Sattler, and for good reason. She's literally the only adult female human in the entire film. In the amber mine, at the archeological dig, in the control room, in the dinosaur birthing chamber, women have, at best, walkthrough roles while men are in command. Bellin's argument is that Dr. Sattler is there basically just to reinforce Grant's presence and primacy throughout the film. The first sighting of a full-figured dinosaur, for example, is insistently, even aggressively, granted to him. Having first spotted the Brachiosaur, he rises from the jeep, removing his sunglasses, while Sattler, too busy fussing over a plant to notice that there's something much bigger happening in the field, needs to have her head turned by the force of her partner's hand before she catches on. As the sequence concludes, Sattler appears slightly out of focus behind Grant, snuggling up to him and confirming his authority of vision in the reflected glow of what she can only bask. Okay, so Sattler's point of view definitely takes a backseat to Grant's in this scene. He's the guy we're supposed to be viewing the scene through. The film employs very specific filmic language to make that clear. But then, we don't spend much time with Malcolm in this scene, or Gennaro, or Hammond. They each get one or two shots apiece. Sattler, meanwhile, stays with Grant for the entire sequence. From the first shot of the Brachiosaur to the final shot of the scene, she's only excluded from a single camera setup that includes Grant. But I bet I know what Bellin would say to that. It's not if she's included in the scene, but how. Always behind Grant, following his lead, slightly out of focus, basking in his reflected glow. Bellin's point is that Sattler's only here to reinforce Grant's masculine primacy. And he might be onto something. I mean, it's not like this dynamic has ever flipped anywhere else in the movie, right? Right? God creates dinosaurs. God destroys dinosaurs. God creates man. Man destroys God. Man creates dinosaurs. Dinosaurs eat man. Woman inherits the earth. Okay, well now here's a shot of Sattler busting Malcolm's nads about his use of patriarchal language, and now Grant's the one who's out of focus in the background. And see how the camera follows her movement at the end of the shot, affirming her vision, prioritizing her perspective? And when you start to look for it, you'll find that Sattler's perspective is actually sort of emphasized, like, all throughout the film. Oh, but Bellin doesn't ignore Sattler's perspective. On the contrary, he feeds it right back into his thesis. Formal film analysis is absolutely obsessed with the gaze. Where people look, when, who gets to, and how are all critical factors when trying to determine what a film communicates. Bellin does well to highlight the primacy of vision throughout Jurassic Park. There's a near constant emphasis on who's looking, what's being seen, and what power dynamics those looks are communicating. Girl. And to sum up Bellin's argument, when men look, they do it to gain agency and affirmation. Keep absolutely still. This vision is based on movement. But when women look, they're either horrified, or the look itself is nothing short of horrific. And at first glance, 
yeah, women would seem to be the face of terror in this film. Bellin singles out one shot right at the end of the film in which Sattler finally gets to look at something and not experience terror, but Bellin says it's only because her look is affirming the heteropatriarchal status quo. This sequence reiterates at the film's close its gendered hierarchy of vision. The male look is self-affirming, while the woman's is rewarded, indeed permitted, only because it embraces the patriarchal unit to which she willingly subordinates herself. When the woman looks, she sees a family. When the man looks, he sees himself. Warrior, hero, savior. To prove his point, Bellin brings up the only other gendered pair of characters in the film, Lex and Tim. On the one hand, Tim's desire to see is not only presented as a natural outgrowth of his maleness, but is encouraged and rewarded. On the few occasions in which Lex does express a desire to look, she suffers punishment, or at least indignity, for doing so. Well again, except when she doesn't. There are plenty of instances of Lex looking at something that pleases her. Not to mention she's the one who gets to reactivate the park security systems at the end of the film. It's a human system. I know this. Using a set of skills that her brother had previously mocked her for. I'm a hacker. That's what I said. You're a nerd. And Tim gets plenty of scares all to himself. And Sattler experiences plenty of joy throughout the film too, even when she's not watching Grant play dad. Bellin singles out the Triceratops scene as an instance in which the film forces Sattler to fulfill the stereotypically feminine role of nurse. And so the fact that she does so much joyful looking in this scene does nothing to temper his criticism. <laughs> but let's take a closer look. Grant is the one who coos in awe at his childhood favorite dinosaur. Yeah, yeah, she was like my favorite when I was a kid, and now I see she's the most beautiful thing I ever saw. <laughs> Which is something that Bellin criticized Sattler for during the raptor nursery scene. Oh my god! <laughs> and while Grant is busy turning her gastralia into a bounce house, Sattler's the one who's trying to figure out what's actually wrong with her. It's pharmacological and local plant life. Grant looks to satisfy his nostalgia. Sattler looks to solve a crisis. Is this West Indian lilac? What's Sattler's job, by the way? Uh, this is our paleobotanist, Dr. Sattler. Paleobotany, which Bellin refers to as the female preoccupation with plants and flowers. But then where does that female preoccupation eventually take her? That is one big pile of shit. The men hang back while Sattler forges ahead. Into poop. Whereupon she's characterized as. She's, uh. Tenacious. You have no idea. You know what Bellin has to say about the poop scene? You will remember to wash your hands before you eat anything. No, I was asking. I, I couldn't find anything about it in his book. Part four. So. Bellin is. wrong? So look, it's not that Bellin isn't onto something with his close reading of the film. This video isn't meant to be a takedown of his work. On the contrary, I consider this to be a continuation of what he wrote. You know, you read what others had done, and you, and you took the next step. In an earlier chapter of the book, Bellin lays into the racist coding of King Kong. And I mean, he really goes for it. He talks about how racism is an inviolable ingredient to the film's cultural heritage, and that the fantasy elements do more to offer its racist white audience plausible deniability more than anything else. But then towards the end of that chapter, he mentions, almost as an aside, that it's also one of his all-time favorite films. So what's going on here? Is he excusing the racist coding in the film? Far from it. Throughout this study, I assume the perspective of the dominant, in this context, white, culture in the creation, circulation, and reception of fantasy films. I do not regret this choice, nor do I retreat from it here. Yet as I also said, any approach to alienation in fantasy film that selects only dominant social attitudes and readings is necessarily partial. Bellin tells us that the close readings in his book are all specifically constructed from the perspective of the dominant white cultures that made the films in question. So of course his interpretations are going to skew towards the aggressive, the racist, the heteropatriarchal. But that's not a value judgment of the films themselves. That's the difference between formal film analysis and some of the more reactionary stuff you find on YouTube. Nobody's coming to cancel King Kong, least of all Joshua David Bellin, but it's important I would even say necessary, to seriously consider what regressive elements a culture that made any given film might have imparted onto it. I want critical readings of the media I enjoy. The world has just changed so radically and we're all running to catch up. How else would we know that Ellie Sattler is the only adult character in Jurassic Park who's credited with her first name instead of her last? 
And I, for one, am glad that there are writers like Joshua David Bellin out there who pay attention to this sort of stuff. If you happen to know Mr. Bellin, please don't send him this video. I want him to like me. But when it comes to Jurassic Park, it really does sound like Bellin doesn't like it very much. So at the very least, I'm happy to offer a gendered reading of the film that doesn't prioritize the conservative heteropatriarchal perspective. Part 5. A gendered reading of the film that doesn't prioritize the conservative heteropatriarchal perspective. My take on Jurassic Park is that it's not a story about the restoration of the patriarchal family unit, but rather a recalibration of traditional patriarchal gender roles that denies the men in power their desire to control biology on any regressive ideological grounds, where women are free to occupy the traditionally masculine role of saving the day, while the men are busy either getting eaten or hunkering down in a bunker to literally wait out the storm. In any other movie, Muldoon would have been the one to save the day, case in point Jurassic World, but instead he gets outflanked within minutes. Clever girl. And then Sattler's the one who goes and restores the power. She's also the one who gets to articulate not only the film's stated thesis, when we have control again. You've never had control, that's the illusion! But also the thesis of my particular reading. It ought to be me really going. Why? Well, I'm a, a neuron. Look. Come on, let's go. We can discuss sexism and survival situations when I get back. Like, there's a reason Sattler's such an enduring action movie heroine. And it's not because she exemplifies female passivity and the ideal of motherhood. I'm going with him. You could definitely still argue that Grant's arc is that of dad. Your hair is all sticking up. But in the final scene of the film, Grant looks less to me like a warrior, hero, savior, so much as a brooding mother hen. Not in a bad way, but not in a warrior male sort of way either. An image which is then reinforced by the shot of the pelicans outside the window. Oh, and speaking of the final scene, you know how Sattler began the film dressed in pink and Grant was dressed in blue? By the end of the film, they switched. Run. Sattler's now in blue and Grant has shifted more towards the earth tones. I am not the first person to point this out, by the way. Cosmovoid did a great video about color symbolism in Jurassic Park that I'll link below. Then there's the dinosaurs themselves. <laughs> Bellin says the dinosaurs are consistently characterized as monstrous, and that's definitely true for most of the film, but come on. By the end of the movie, half the audience is rooting for the dinosaurs. When I saw the maiden road attack, I said, I think our star in this movie is the T-Rex. The audience will hate me if the T-Rex doesn't come back and make one more heroic appearance. <laughs> Bellin repeatedly interprets the dinosaurs as a sort of unified block of feminine resistance, but that's only half the story. Every single dinosaur in the film is categorically either cis female or trans male. I say trans not in the sense that these dinosaurs all have a unique gender identity like we humans do, but that their ability to change biological sex could be compared to our ability to change gender, or even just gender roles. Sex and gender are not interchangeable terms, mind you, but they are analogous when comparing mutant dinosaurs that spontaneously change biological sex to human beings expressing non-traditional gender roles and gender fluidity. I know it sounds like I'm nitpicking the shit out of my own video here, but there is a lot of turfy bullshit flying around the internet right now and I don't want my audience to make assumptions about either me or my terminology. Gender is a spectrum, trans rights are human rights, and this is not a turf-friendly channel. Now go follow Riley Black on Twitter and be sure to buy all our books. But back to the main point. The dinosaur's ability to change sex from male to female in a single sex environment is hardly the heteropatriarchal ideal, and what's more, I don't think the association is as negative as Bellin would have us think. I know this is kind of an insipid example, but when I first heard about the existence of trans people at like the age of six or whatever, I literally thought to myself, oh, like Jurassic Park. It wasn't a thorough understanding to be sure. Like, I'm not arguing that a pack of voracious mutant raptors is the best way to represent the trans community. But it wasn't a negative association either. Do you want to talk about how Nedry's death is emblematic of something? How about the fact that no dinosaur is more aggressively misgendered than the poor Dilophosaurus? Oh, nice boy. Oh, nice boy. Nice dinosaur. Oh. I thought you were one of your big brothers, you're not so bad. Bellin argues that the sex-changing raptors still reinforce the film's patriarchal ideology, because it's pushing the idea that the natural way of things is for men to inevitably rise to the top. Mother nature ensures the survival of father family. But Bellin also spends a lot of time arguing that the dinosaurs represent strictly maternal forces. So which is it? Do the dinosaurs represent feminine chaos or paternal sovereignty? They can't be both. 
Ultimately, by the end of the film, the dinosaur's freedom isn't something to negate or destroy anyway. It's just something to adjust to. Guess we'll just have to evolve too. When Grant learns that the dinosaurs are not only breeding, but spontaneously changing sex in order to do it, it's not presented as something that either he or the audience are meant to balk at. We're in awe. I found a way. This film can't only be read as a story about reasserting patriarchy. It's also, maybe even more so, about achieving a new equilibrium through the eradication of traditional gender roles and the fluidity of sex and gender itself. Or at least, that's the interpretation that makes the most sense to me. Part 6. Okay, but seriously. Is Jurassic Park sexist or not? Bellin does well to point out that the dominant political narrative at the time of the film's release was that traditional heteropatriarchal family values were under attack. So you tell the opposition, we stand for family values. And there's no reason to think that political narrative had no effect on the film. I would argue that the preoccupation of the Jurassic Park series with father-headed families that are threatened by, indeed, that come into existence through their battles with maternal forces, places these films squarely in the dominant family values camp. The fact that family values discourse, or at least its torchbearers, lost in 1992, suggests the possibility of reading Jurassic Park as part of a program to defend a putatively threatened ideological consensus. The intensification of family values discourse under perceived conditions of attack. And I mean, sure. I'll concede that Jurassic Park is definitely either a program to defend the putatively threatened ideological consensus of family values discourse, or a pointed rejection of same. Definitely one or the other. So now the question is, are there any clues in the film itself to suggest that it's a rejection of conservative family values ideology? I believe that there are, and what's more, I think Bellin's the one who points them out for us. Bellin ends with an analysis of the film's conclusion. The reclamation of patriarchy at the close of Jurassic Park is considerably less than convincing. In its chaotic final act, from the raptor's hunt to the reappearance of the tyrannosaur, the film makes a merry hash of its own values, in large part by aping them mercilessly. Lex, briefly empowered within the kitchen, fights off the monsters, her weapons of choice a soup ladle and a dumbwaiter. Grant and Sattler, ineffectively barring the front door against a leering intruder, are upstaged by a preteen playing video games. And finally, just before before the family groups escape from the island, the patriarch's protective shield is spitefully exposed as tissue thin. As the raptors in the rotunda coil for the kill, Grant stations himself in front of Sattler and the children, a position that at best prepares him as a sacrificial lamb, only to be rescued by, of all things, a single woman in the shape of a cruising tyrannosaur. The family system is not secure. The domestic scene that concludes the film cannot veil the fact that loose women remain on the prowl, their matriarchal ability to shake the controls of patriarchy hatching sequels to try the marrow and sinews of fresh fathers. So yeah, Bellin's definitely either highlighting Jurassic Park's inability to prove its own regressive themes, or... Or, these aren't the film's actual themes at all. We're kind of straying outside the realm of formal film criticism with all these value judgments all of a sudden, but I don't care. I love this movie, and I'm here to defend it in my own small little way. Close readings have their uses to be sure, but they're never supposed to supplant the big picture. And if Tumblr's taught me anything, it's that Queen Rex is one of the most celebrated, non-binary, gender-fluid icons in all of movie history. This video was sponsored by Frome.co. Ever since I graduated college, I've always wanted to decorate my apartment based on my taste in movies. But hanging up a poster always felt a little too dorm roomy, and even fan art can feel a little weird hanging over your kitchen table. But now there's Frome. Frome produces beautiful, high-quality canvas prints at near 8K resolution that depict the chromatic chronology of your favorite films. From their website, the canvases you see are movies condensed into chronological color strips. The movie begins with a single color strip at the start of the canvas to the left and ends with the last strip to the right. Can you guess what this one is? It's Jurassic Park. Yeah. More purple than I would have expected. See this green strip here? That's the Gallimimus Stampede. And see this light blue? Pretty sure that's when Nedry steals the embryos. When I first found these things, I spent an hour scrolling through every single film I'd ever seen before on their website. Because not only are they beautiful pieces of art, they also reveal some interesting things about the films. Take Halloween. I don't know what I expected when I first clicked on it, but when I saw this I thought, huh. 
I guess the second quarter of the film is the only part that takes place during the day. Others are just hilarious to me because they're exactly what you'd expect. Like check out Interview with a Vampire, or anything directed by Chris Nolan. The other thing I like so much about From is their selection. Sure, they've all got the bro-y favorites like Star Wars and Pulp Fiction, but they've also got stuff like The Birdcage, Legally Blonde, Showgirls, and they add new ones all the time based on customer suggestions. By the time this video is up, they'll have added another 40 to their collection. So if you're in the market for an expertly stylized canvas art centerpiece that reveals as much about the films themselves as it does your own taste in movies, head on over to from.co slash hashtag cold crash pictures. I'll put a link in the description below where you can get 10% off your order by using the discount code cold crash 10 off. That's from.co slash hashtag cold crash pictures. Discount code cold crash 10 off. So